What's up, guys? Welcome to the Podcast. My name is Solomon Ali <laughs> at Solomon Ali NBA on Twitter. Joined by Forrest Walker at Do Not on Twitter. How you doing, Forrest? Hey, not too bad. Uh, the weather continues to be good, and the Rockets continue to win. They continue to be good as well. Uh, so, what's interesting is we've spent the past few episodes. T- well, actually, before we get into all that, if you like the podcast, make sure to like <laughs> the YouTube video, share it with your friends, comment down below, and subscribe for new episodes every week. If you're listening to the audio version, be sure to give us five stars on Apple, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Those are the best ways to help others find the show. So I, I keep forgetting to say that stuff, so I have it in my script now. <laughs> so what's interesting is we spent like the last few episodes kind of talking about everything but the basketball. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And meanwhile, uh, the Rockets have won eight professional basketball games in a row. So let's mm-hmm. do something new this week. Let's talk Rockets basketball for us. We're not going to talk hey. much about the front office. We're not going to sure. talk much about extensions or trades or contracts. I want to stick with just Rockets basketball this week because as we're recording, as I just said, the Rockets have won eight American basketball games this week. <laughs> uh, six of those games uh, were won after Cam Whitmore, and more importantly, the team's best player, Alperen Shangun, went down. Um, there are several reasons for this. Uh, we can get into it, but... Forrest, how have you been taking this all in? Like, uh, has there been anything revelatory during this win streak for you? I mean, all right. Uh, It's been pretty notable that they've been this good and looked still pretty good defensively without Cam and Shingun, obviously. Uh, Which is not only that, but uh, Ahmed looks great. And more surprisingly, Jalen looks great. Jalen Green continues to shoot the lights out. He is on an absolute tear, which is wonderful. Like, it hasn't even... We talked about, like, we need to see him get rid of the bad games out of his repertoire and just, like, have good to great games. He just has great games for the last couple of weeks now. He he won't miss, which, great. Uh, <laughs> I don't... People have talked about perhaps it's the spacing is a lot easier for him to work with, but... Whatever is happening, Jalen Green has stepped up to the occasion, and I am delighted to see it because this has gone from a team that really needed to clamp down on defense because they did not have the ability to score in enough bunches to blow people out to just putting up like 147 points (laughs) on the Utah Jazz. So that's a market improvement uh, in terms of shooting. I don't know how much of that is due to player improvement and how much of that is due to like a different a different personnel and a different shape of the offense and how much of that is just they're just hitting their shots because you can't count that out in modern NBA because sometimes teams just hit a lot of hit a lot of shots I mean the Spurs were like the best shooting the best three-point shooting team in basketball for like three weeks and the worst the rest of the season so I don't know it's a confluence of factors what do you think so there, I have a feeling. I'm glad you hit on that first. That's probably the most like in, that's the biggest story, right? It's Jalen Green. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we're gonna spend the bulk of this podcast talking about. It. So I want to talk about some of the other stuff first, and then we'll get into yeah. like, a larger conversation about this. So obviously, Shangun goes down, and you know, for most, for the most part, like we as fans are kind of like crushed, right? Like we're kind of like, okay, that's the season. You know, like yeah. like whatever whatever just happened happened. Like they're they're gonna probably at best maintain what they have been so far, right for the rest of the year, uh, which was a bad team, right? They 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 were like six games under five hundred, right? Uh, and so it seemed like okay, the play-in tournament, all hope is lost for that. Um, and right now you're just gonna have to spend the last like three weeks, um, just kind of making sure no one else gets hurt. You know, like. Maybe at some point you talk about packing it in. You and I talked about this for us, uh, how that was a thought for you, right? Like perhaps uh, if you're the front office, you talk about, you know, you know, kind of packing it in. And yeah. Ime goes out there. Uh, obviously, like, like the first move, the first decision you have to make is like who starts in this place, right? And I, I, I thought the decision seemed pretty logical to go with the men Thompson. Like that's kind of who I thought was the best person to go in there because you can play four out now because uh shangun goes to the bench and now you you put in a man and you're still four out again right and you can still play with that um and you can play a little bit faster i think uh you kind of have to play faster by necessity because you're not getting the same low post look with shangun anymore 
you have you can gamble a little more, a bit more defensively. You are a little bit more conservative with um, with uh, Alperin Shangun for obvious reasons. He has limitations. You can't play with. with you have to play around those limitations. Uh, Ime gives this quote after the first game they play, and it got a lot of play. Right? It got a lot of people got angry at the quote, and I didn't really. So I'll read the quote. I'll read the quote. Uh, this is Ime after uh, Shingun goes down. I think it gives us more options without LP out there. There's that, that's the only benefit I would say. We can only we could get to more switching and more aggressive stuff defensively. Then we would have to find different ways to score. As much as we can get stops and get out and run, that's got to that's going to pay dividends to play in the open court and finding different ways to use different guys. I think we saw a man setting a lot of screens with uh, the five men out on him. Jabari can pick and pop, and Jock Landale can do some of the things that LP does. So the low post scoring will be missed, no doubt, but the others will, other players will step up and contribute. So I think a lot of people took this as a shot to Shingun, and I didn't view it that way. Like, in fact, I thought he was quite differential to Shingun in that quote, because he talks about how the only benefit, I would say, is that we have more options, right? That's yeah. very, he very directly starts this quote with, like, the only thing I can positive I can think of here is like we can do more stuff, right? Now we can't do the stuff that we're best at to the highest degree possible, right? Like we may be we're a more flexible team, but that doesn't mean we are a better team. He never ever says in this quote that we're better off without Shangun, but people read it as oh we're better off without Shangun. All he's saying is we're, we're more versatile without Shangun. That doesn't mean being more versatile doesn't necessarily mean being better, right? So, yeah. I agreed with the quote, right? The Rockets can do more defensively and offensively without Shingun, right? They're not as good as of, a, of a basketball team without him. They're not as talented. And, to the, you know, at the highest levels of basketball, they're going to pay a price for not having him out there. But that doesn't mean you can't do some cool stuff, like some stuff you weren't able to do before. And, um, I don't know, like, I, I read the quote as a very, like, obvious, okay, like, this is a pivot the Rockets are going to make stylistically. And that's kind of what they did. The Rockets, before Shingun's injury, were 14th in pace uh, and 24th in offense. The Rockets, after Shingun's injury, are 5th in pace uh, and 2nd in offense. Now, a lot of that is kind of inflated because of that last game they just played, right? Like, they really ran it up on the Utah Jazz, right? And, sure the did. and the competition in general hasn't great. Like, they're playing some really awful defenses, right? Like, Washington's in there. Uh, like, it, the schedule has been softish, right? But... Yes. They are utilizing the, you know, kind of a run and gun style, which I think you kind of have to. Uh, they're playing Jabari at the five. Uh, they're having uh, a man kind of play the power forward, uh, and they're they're really getting out in transition. And it's not really so much that they're getting they're turning their opponent over a lot. It's more so they're starting offenses like half court possessions quicker. They're just playing faster. They're a little bit more zip yeah. in everything that they do, right? Um, and you know, like the you know the 15 second possessions that you were feeding the ball into Shingun are like being replaced by like 10 second possessions where Jalen Green is doing like a driving kick, right? It's just different. It's not necessarily better. I mean, in the long term, but it's just different. It's zippier, right? Um, and I I I I gotta be honest. It's a really fun brand of basketball to watch. Uh, I'm a little bummed that Cam can't be out there with these guys because I feel like in this style, Cam would. I mean, he'll thrive in any style. Cam's really, really freaking good. But Cam and Tari would look awesome in this mix. And I'm bummed, I'm bummed they're not out there. Yeah, I mean, Cam might be back out there at some point this season. That's true. That, yeah, that door is not closed. Yeah. Uh, I'd love to see him back. It. This is kind of the style of basketball that I think people thought we were going to see with the Rockets uh, in the last couple seasons. Because this is, you know, young guys running fast making passes, you know, driving kick, shooting threes. Like, the Schenken style is a very particular type of basketball. And I understand what you mean about, like, and what Uduka means about having more options. Because there is, they are kind of locked into a certain thing with Schenken. I think it's probably long-term and playoff-wise a better thing. Yeah. Because it's harder to solve. But in the regular season, being able to throw a whole bunch of stuff at different teams... It can pay off, especially against the teams you should be beating. And the Rockets beating the teams they should be beating is really good. I think it speaks to growth over the season, too, that 
after a whole bunch of a really difficult middle of the season, they are going out and taking care of business when the schedule does soften up. Right, and yes, obviously, like I do think that strength of schedule is largely an underappreciated stat. I think that doing this against like the Blazers and the Wizards and the Jazz is like not nearly as impressive as doing this against, say, say the Nuggets or, or what have you, but it's still good. It's still impressive. It still means that they are a decent, solid team. Like they, they're back to 500 now and they look like a 500 team. They look like that's where they should be. And that's, that's real progress. And even without Shingun out there, it's a bummer not to see Shingun out there. Uh, the only worry, which I don't think is a concern, will be that, you know, this... I think some people are excited to make a lot of the team being good without Shingun. I don't think the front office is among that number, right? I'd like, I don't think that the Rockets team is going to overreact to this. I had a couple people texting me about this, right? Uh, non houston mm-hmm. people, right? Like, like a few people were texting me like, hey, should we take anything <laughs> away from Shingun just not being there and them playing better? Like, uh, is Jalen going to be uh, – someone this morning, in fact, actually texted me. He's like, hey, is Jalen going to be fine with Shingun? Like, right? I'm like, here's the thing, guys. Like, some of this is like they're hitting a ton of shots, as you said. They're 40% yeah. from three over their last six games, right? <laughs> that is not sustainable. Right. But. Uh, and also, Jalen was starting to turn the corner while Shangun was still playing, right? If you look at Jalen's run, that was – we're talking about a le- yeah. an 11-game Jalen run, not like a, a six-game Jalen run. We're yes. talking this, a, yeah. yeah, this hot period started before Shangun was injured out. And I think, mm-hmm. like, it's – he was <sighs> – it's been like longer now in this run that he's been injured out than the when he was still playing, but it was like it was like four or so games before he got injured that they started really turning it around like this. So yes, yeah, so it's a very good point. This this wasn't a Shangun goes out then they're playing well thing. This is to me they all started playing better and then Shangun went out during the process situation. Yeah, and then post All Star break, Ime Udoka kind of emphasized that the team wanted to shoot more threes. Right. Yes. And they, they kind of want, yeah, <laughs> they, they wanted to head in, in in this direction. That now they're shooting about thirty-five to forty-three game, like a modern NBA offense, which is good. Uh, right. It's kind of weird that they, they kind of deviated from that from that a bit the past couple of years. Uh, maybe that's that's uh, something to do with Maury not being here, kind of not enforcing that in coaching contracts anymore. I don't know. I can't I can't speculate. Like, I, but it, it is kind of strange that we've kind of they've kind of deviated a little bit from. From that identity as an organization, I, it's not necessarily a bad or a good thing. I'm not making a value judgment here, but that is interesting. Um, so they're they're hitting their threes. They're playing faster. Uh, they're playing a really switchable brand of defense, right? Which with the men, yes. Jabari, uh, Jay Sean Tate out there sometimes. Uh, obviously, you got Van Vliet still playing uh, out there on the perimeter. Uh, uh, obviously Dylan Brooks, like they, they they can switch a lot more than they could before this, right? Uh, and you know, this leads us to Jalen Green. Well, first I, I did want to say Udoka does deserve credit to kind of he, he didn't fold it in, right? Which a lot of no. a lot of people in this position might have felt tempted to do, right? Like personally, watching this team, I would I, I might have thought, hey, it's time to think about next season. Let's kind of drop some concepts to like. Build a build towards playing as a Shingun team again next year, right? He's like, no, let's go, let's explore this, let's explore the roster that we have, let's go see what we can do here. Udoka deserves credit for that, right? Kind of pivoting as quickly as he did. Um, now let's talk about Jalen Green, right? Uh, so he's been, or let's just say he's been disappointing for the first sixty games of the season, right? Now he kind of looks back on track to being the player that a lot of us thought he could be like kind of like a multi-time all-star kind of guy right but it is notable that a lot of this is just him hitting his shots right i'm gonna read out i'm gonna read out the stats real quick before before we get into like this right we're getting into like what's happening why it's happening over the last 11 games which the rockets are 10 11 in and and it's, it's not like a like he's playing well uh, outside of the team contest, he's like a plus 155 uh, in these 11 games, right? Uh, so he's sure. averaging, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like 15 plus 15 per game, basically, which is ridiculous. Um, 
27.8 points per game, 5.7 rebounds per game, uh, 3.4 assists per game, a steal per game, uh, four threes a game, 51% from the field, 52%, I mean 42% from three, uh, 80% from the free throw line. Um, he's been ridiculous. Like this is a an absolute tear. Uh, it genuinely feels when I watch him that he's just making a lot of the shots that he was getting before. Like he's getting the same looks. Mm-hmm. He's just hitting them. Like he's and if you if you think if you think that I'm making that up, here here's Jalen before March first. 59% from the restricted area, 38.5% from mid-range, 31% from three-point range. Here's Jalen since March 1st, 79% from the restricted area, 45% from mid-range, 42% from three-point range. Like, he, his shooting has just completely turned around, right? So and it's not like... Go ahead. That three, the, all right, the three-point thing... You can maybe write off as this is just, you know, he's just hitting them now. Three points are noisy. But the around the rim is very notable to me. Well, <laughs> That's no, the kind yeah. of number that doesn't change overnight, usually. Well, I, I did want to say, so if you're, wa- if you're watching this, this stretch from Jalen and it feels a little familiar to you, that's because it is. I'm going to so read some other stats to you. 57% right. from the restricted area. 33% from mid-range, 31% from three-point range. That is Jalen Green before March of 2022, his rookie year. And this is Jalen Green after March 2022, his rookie year. 71% from the restricted area, 46% from mid-range, 40% from three-point range. So I, like you, had that same thought. Like, So is he just getting better finishing around the basket? And then I looked into his number and it's like, okay, so he's done this before. Right, so I don't really quite know what the hell is going on. Here, <laughs> right, yeah. Like, because if you look into his G League numbers with the Ignite, the first half of his G League season, similar thing happened. Right, he plays. He, I, I didn't write down the numbers, but he, but he is inefficient for that first half of his Ignite season. The second half, he starts going off again, and I'm kind of, I kind of think it's a confidence thing. I, I don't know. It's, a, it's like a streaky shooter. Slash confidence thing with him. His you know who else show. does this? Go ahead, yeah. Uh, Damian Lillard tends to do this, where he'll go nuts yeah. in, like, March, late in the season, and he'll kind of have a lull in, like, the middle of the season. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. He does do that. I, I hadn't thought about I hadn't made the D- Lillard connection, but that is true. Like, his percentages go, like, way off uh, the deep end in March, and it, it's, it might just be a function of getting into rhythm. But it's also, like, very tangible that he is shooting this well, right? It does go yeah. towards the ledger. Like, he well, is back to... And his like, shot looks good, too. Not just not his numbers are up, but, like, his mechanics look good right now. That game last night against the Jazz, it felt like he wouldn't, he wouldn't stop, right? <laughs> yeah. And if you squint and you turn your head a little bit it's almost like like Jalen's growing like hair follicles right and it's like <laughs> it's like oh is he left-handed now you know like like right like it, it, it feels like the, when he gets going from three like that and he hits and he's the step back jumper is hitting it feels mm-hmm. hardenesque right and and this is coming from two guys who've watched James, the entirety of Harden's career right so like we're not just I'm not just saying that like I, it just feels like that when, when he's hitting the three like that now I am concerned that he had that start to the season and I am deeply concerned about how he's going to become a more consistent basketball player next season right like there's something here I'm not sure if it's a mechanical thing with a shot or if it's if it's just pure confidence, something happens to him at the beginning of seasons where he just comes out a little slow, and then he gets going after the All Star break, and the Rockets need to key in on that and figure out what's going on and make sure he plays like this, maybe not <laughs> quite as good as this, right? Like this is he's shooting like sixty four percent true shooting in March or something, maybe not quite this good, but can we get a middle ground 
right? Can can can, can he find the middle the, the middle ground between this and, and in the beginning of the season? I mean, I'd take this, but I don't. We're not gonna get this the whole season. No. If we got this the whole season, then he'd be like a top five player or something. Yeah, which that's Kevin I'd, Durant, right? Yeah, that's Kevin which Durant. I sincerely doubt he can do this all season, but. You know what? If he wants to go ahead and prove me wrong, I'm open to it. But uh, you're talking about for the rest of the season or for next season? just the, uh, for for uh, oh, however for always? Season. Sure, why not? Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't think he's going to. I don't think this is just who he is because that's no. a ludicrous situation. But if his jumper is just like the hope is that he's been working on his jumper and that it. All right, working on a jumper tends to break down your shot and then build it back up, right? So I think we can't also count out that perhaps he's just in season been working on it, and it gets worse, and then it gets better as he like as he gets used to it. So the hope has to be that his shooting is going to be not this improved, but like somewhat improved going forward. So we're but the fact expe- that <laughs> expect the first sixty games of the season he's just well, shooting around. Like, well, that's the thing. How is early that like, should he get to the Twitter center supports? Like, should he get there like eight eight hours for the game? I guess so. I mean, that's the thing is that he shouldn't be. This sh- like he shouldn't be happening every season though. In that case, so I think it like the confidence part of it might be something. I mean, I think there's also something you said for when he really just has the reins to the team, he can do more of his stuff, right? Like he can try to get to the rim more. He can have the ball in his hands more. He can shoot more. And I guess he just needs that to get in rhythm or something. And that's that to me would be the worry that he needs to be the number one guy, or else he's not going to be able to do this. Like, can he not? Can he not play a little? Can he have a few less touches and still be efficient? Does he need to have more touches to be better? Uh, in that case, you get a question mark. But we need to see, we need to see next season to know what's going to happen here. I think is the deal because this has raised a lot of questions. They're good questions to have raised, but. I think the hints of can he coexist with someone like Shin Goon, who is an obvious first option, is a question we need to keep. Not, we don't need to answer it right now, but we need to like keep looking into it over the course of this next season. I think. Uh, I I don't know. I mean, if he if he's this good with the ball in his hands, but he needs the ball in his hands, then you got to make some choices. See, I mean. Here's here's my thing, and, and like my, my stance on this hasn't really changed that that much. Like, I think him and Jalen conceptually fit. To, I mean, him and Shingun conceptually just fit together, real like hand in glove. Like, I don't think there should be any reason they don't fit together. In fact, when you look at their numbers together, Jalen's still playing better with Shingun, right? But I do think this is a matter of him initiating possessions with the ball in his hands, which I think is more of an indication that he needs to be a point guard in the future. Right? Like, I, mean, I don't think the shooting guard that's going to last. I really <laughs> don't. Right? Like, Van Vliet's there right now. He's there to steady the ship and help them get on track in the rebuild. But I, I think I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Jalen's competition can't be Shangu. It has to be a Men Thompson. Yeah. It has to be a Men Thompson. For him to be the best version of himself, in this league, you can't be that and be a shooting guard anymore. You have to be better defensively uh, to, to be this, right? You, you have to be much more, right? So I think the best version of Jalen comes as, as a primary ball handler. So he needs, to, he needs to get to a point where he can be that. Yeah, and I mean... <sighs> I think that's right, and I think that sounds a lot of fun. Like, seeing Jalen bring up the ball and then slot into, you know... Once Fred Van Vliet is no longer uh, an important option for the team, which, as we to go back over it again, Fred Van Vliet and Dylan Brooks are not supposed to be long-term options of the Rockets. They are here to transition to whatever the next thing is. And so the idea of Jalen taking over for Van Vliet sounds really fun, because then you could have someone like Cam Whitmore next to him, yeah. And they could really do some fun stuff. And then you could have Amen um, off the bench, blah, blah. Anyway, that's not, that sounds like Atari a lot of fun. Jabari started at three, yeah. right? Yeah, like. Yeah. 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 J- Jabari stays at the four, Shangun at the five. Like, And then and then the Amen thing is a little complicated because I do have questions. Yeah. We'll, we'll, 
you want to you want to transition to a men real quick, or do you want to stay on Jalen? Let's. There's a lot. There's a lot of meat on this bone. Right? Let's Which talk is, about Amen. I feel like we've. Well, I feel like we talked about Jalen a lot yeah. <laughs> over right. the last several weeks, and I'd like to talk about Amen a little bit because he has been worth talking about, to say the least. Yeah. Well, one last thing on. I want to say. Want to make one last yeah. point on Jalen. I think last week I made the point that. I, these other prospects are just better than him. These other guard prospects are just better. I shouldn't have said it as confidently as I said it, right? This is not a retraction. This is more like a slight retraction. I think with the men, it's closer, right? With Cam, I still think Cam's a be- I, It's controversial for me to be saying this after he just – Jalen just dropped 42 points last night. But I still think Cam, what con- considering what he showed as a 19-year-old versus what Jalen showed as a 19-year-old, I still prefer Cam as a prospect. Right, but the amen thing because the jump shot is such a concern, and because the, there are real fit questions I have with him on the roster with other players, yeah. that is a closer competition. So that that transition to the amen thing, I mean, he is so good with four shooters around him. Like he like having four out four guys facing four. I think, like, and I say this as a as a Shangun guy. Like I love Shangun. This Amen and Shingun fit long term and until one of these guys develops a jump shot or if these guys, until one of yeah. these guys can develop that, I don't know that that's a fit offensively. You can't have two non-shooters on the floor, at the, on the floor anymore at the same time in, in today's NBA. You, I don't think you can. Right? Yeah, you just, you just need to have, yeah. You just need that three-point threat to make everything work. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think and scoring is just too high for that. Yeah, right. And, and when you put a man in the dunker spot next to Shingun, you just you're just asking for the defender to slide over and double Shingun, which is why I think Shingun's efficiency dipped towards the, the second half of the year because a man came back, right? Because a man was hurt most of the year. Mm-hmm. A man comes back. That second defender is constantly sliding over to, to guard Shingun because he's because because a man's in the dunker spot, right? So you put him in the dunker spot here. Well, Jabari's spacing the floor for you, right? There's no that, that paint's empty. That's that's immense, right? So <laughs> and he's gonna use it. And he's gonna use it. He's gonna dunk and he's gonna dunk and he's gonna dunk. That's what a man does, man. <laughs> a man dunks. A man yeah. dunks. <laughs> it's it's fantastic. He pl- There have been so many like there have been so many guards who don't have a good three point shot in the league over the years, and you just go. Damn! Can you just get to the rim every every possession, please? And Amen's like, "That's a great idea." Yes, he's like, "Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just do that." <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he who can stop him, right? Because not only is he like quite flexible, right? He is, I think, has real strength for the frame that he has, right? He has a, has a way of getting defenders off of and finishing through contact in a way that I think other guys on this roster on this roster can't, right? Fred can't do that. Jalen can't do that. Uh, Cam's the only guy who can, I would say, right? Who can just finish through contact like that, yeah. right? Like a man is he's shooting seventy percent at the rim, Forrest, right? That's like, for the season. It, yeah, but and that doesn't look unsustainable. That just looks like he's dunking every time down. So of course it's going to yeah. be that high. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and. He's not afraid to shoot it. Like, which is, you know, when people compare him to Ben, you get nervous. First of all, I hate how the Ben Simmons comparison is like a negative. Ben Simmons, I'm going to I'm gonna get on my soapbox for you real quick for just a second. Okay. Ben, all right, early, go for it. early career Ben Simmons was <laughs> awesome. Was awesome. Then he gets hurt. He has the nerve, the weird nerve injury in his back. And then he has the confidence thing. And then it falls off a clip. But go look up Ben Simmons. For the first four years of his career, I think it's 2015 he was drafted until like 2019 ish, whatever that year. Into 2015 slash 14 until 2018 slash 19, that was a nice player, right? There were there were fit concerns with him, especially with Embiid out there, um, but he still managed to make it work, and he was also a demon in transition, which is exactly what a man is. He's just four inches shorter. Right, and mm-hmm. uh, is he? He might be just three inches shorter. Uh, but but like, he, regardless, a man is 
I mean, Amen's just good. I mean, Amen's just good. He's smart, and he, he, he makes the right play despite being off the ball without a jump shot, which is hard to do. Yeah. I mean, he his awareness is really, really high for a rookie player. Like, he Very looks comfortable player. out there. Yeah. yeah. He looks comfortable out there. He makes good reads. He makes them quickly, which is really, really shocking, honestly. He just... They just really drafted high IQ rookies this year, the Rockets did. And it's great to see. Amin is a joy to watch every night because he does the thing that everybody wants to see their basketball team do, which is be aggressive every time down, look for the open man, and just, like, never hesitate. He never hesitates, and it's... You, you're going to see an exciting play, like, what, like three, four times a game? He's going to do something that's going to make you, like, want to stand up out of your chair. Which... Yeah. <laughs> and and, and he, he'll do it, and he'll just come, come off the rim stone-faced. Right? Because a man doesn't make facial reactions. <laughs> no, right? he doesn't. Right? He does not. He's just like... He, he's junk. at work. <laughs> right? <laughs> doesn't do it. Does, doesn't... Like, Jalen will scream. He'll get the crowd all excited. A man, dunk, run back. <laughs> like, ro- mm-hmm. Robotic almost. Right? But I love it. I love this robot. I love him. I, like, I, he, is, he is really, really fun to watch. Um, and we'll talk about Jabari. Uh, first, uh, let, let's talk about this uh, scuffle that happened last night because it, it is going to mm-hmm. kind of play a role going into this week. So Jabari uh, gets into it with Chris Dunn. Chris Dunn throws the first punch. Jabari kind of clenches his fist. I, I think he swings. Does, I mean, does he swing? I don't yeah, remember. Yeah, he, he, he tried to go at him, yes. Okay. The, the, like... It was funny because that was the what, like the one moment I looked away from the, the game and I turned back and there was replays of all that happening. Because I, I seem to recall from the replays that Jabari was also trying to fight back, but yeah. uh, pretty quickly players intervened to make sure that, like not much really happened. Right. I'm confused by this force. I don't know why Jabari is getting p- penalized this much. Right. Okay. Like. Maybe throw him out of the game. Okay. Like I, I don't necessarily agree with it, but fine. You, you, you don't want to encourage fighting. He's getting suspended an additional game. Now, Chris Dunn is yes. getting suspended two games, which, you know, cool, like, good that he's getting suspended more. But Jabari was just defending himself. You're telling me that the NBA's official stance is if someone swings at you, you just kind of have to get your ass beat? Like, you just have to sit there? Like, you, you, you can't swing? Like, is that, is that, the, is that mm-hmm. what Joe Dumars is telling people? Like, I don't get it. I, I all right. Now, I want to agree because I love Jabari Smith Jr. And I think it's great that he is setting up for his guys. But I do think there's very important context here, which is that the Rockets get into a scuffle nearly every goddamn game. That's true. (laughs) This is is a team that will not stop scrapping with people, all right? And And I I think, and it's... And, and it's good, it. right? Yeah. It show it shows that Ime has instilled a culture of you know never backing down and fighting back, right? But yeah. the league is tired of it, man. <laughs> they they do not want the Rockets to keep getting in fights. I think as much as anything, this is because they keep doing this, and they're like, you have to stop doing this. You cannot keep fighting other teams every time. Yeah, sure, they always start it, but you're always in it. Other teams don't get in fights this often, so I like. I think in a vacuum. Do you remember you're when right. they tried to fight LeBron James? Like, do you remember when that happened? Like, people just forgot. Mem- people memory hold it because of how much the Rockets have done since then. But Ime tried to fight LeBron. Like, do you, yeah, man. Like, we just all forgot about it. Yeah, this is this is a tough team. This is a team that wants to physically fight people. All right, which again, this is an energy we have not had in Houston in a very long time, if ever. So it's cool to see them, like, it makes me feel good about their potential playoff chances if they're going to be this hard-nosed, but the I think in context, the league's decisions honestly make sense. They cannot they cannot have these guys fighting every single time. They cannot have every game have a scrap in it. So, yeah, I get why they're actually going to suspend him a game. When you explain it that way, I don't, I, I don't hate it as much. Right, like when you when you okay, this is like more. This is not a suspension for Jabari. It's more suspend like a kind of the league like wagging yeah. their finger at the Rockets, like cut it out. Like yeah, I get it's it. a warning shot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, okay, yeah. That makes some more sense. Mm. Um, I, I will say like uh, Dylan Brooks, like he he's a part of this too, right? Like like he, he's, he's a, a big, yeah he's a huge part of this. Like 
the <laughs> what, do you, what the DeRozan thing was was funny because like th- those were two like around and find out guys, right? Like <laughs> like Demar, Demar like Demar DeRozan's he's from Compton, right? Like like it, like Dylan Brooks comes up behind him and Dil- and Demar's like no, yeah. like we're not we're not doing this right not with me. <laughs> <laughs> and and no. I, like like I don't blame either of them. Like I don't I I do blame Demar for like shoving Jalen because he got pissed, right? Like he shouldn't have done that. But like for responding to Dylan the way he did, like hey, I don't I don't I don't mind it. Like yeah, like like I get it. I mean Dylan Dylan's annoying. I don't know. <laughs> like yeah. look, look uh, his antics, his antics are less onerous to me now that he's on the team I'm watching. But yeah, he's a pest. That's kind of his deal. That's that's why he's there in part. Yeah, I mean, like th- this, he's very much taken on like the new this generation's Patrick Beverly for the Rockets, right? Like he he is um, very um, it, he's very much an irritant, uh, probably more so than Beverly, right? But like it, it, it yeah. is it it is uh, Ime and Dylan both like it's it's both their identity kind of going into the Rockets uh, now. I don't want this. I don't want to see this in a playoff game. I'm not gonna lie. Like, if this happens, this could cost them something, right? Like, if if Dylan gets ejected for a key game, or if Jabari gets suspended for a key game, like, I, like, like this is no, right? Like, like they should tone this down a, a touch, right? I'm I'm with you there. Yeah, yeah. But, they they can't they can't be fighting guys. They need to have each other's backs and be ready to like be physical and push back against teams. But yeah, they they can't they can't be like trying to get into a fight like every other game that's not yeah. going to work going forward it's it's like they want they tried to ter- turn their team identity from the pushovers to like the bulldozers and it's like you mm-hmm. know may- may- maybe not go that far in that you know like maybe, <laughs> maybe you know you, you know, yeah. like i'm i'm glad that i'm glad you guys are toughening up right like i'm glad that this is a team that fights every night that competes every night no matter what the score but Perhaps let's like let's bring it down a touch. Like I don't mind that. Well, I got I don't mind so, that as a message. Some, sometimes an overcorrection is a necessary step towards a correction. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Um, but I, I did want to talk about Jabari, right? I, I brought yeah. I brought that up to talk about Jabari. He's just been steady all season, man. Steady Jabari. Like j- he's a professional. Just, just good basketball all year. Just good, right? Like. Sure. Does he have down games? Sure. Right. Do, so do some, sometimes the jump shot not fall? Sure. But for the most part, they fall. And for the most part, uh, he's effective every night. And he's defensively, he is every bit what he was advertised going in, in draft night. Like, I've, I've, I can't remember the last time I've seen a player improve from year one to year two like this. It doesn't happen for us. Like, he was, yeah. what was he, 18 last year? Or you... For the majority of last year, he was 18. Then he turned 19 midseason or something. He was very, he was a very young rookie, right? Then he turned 20 sometime this year. Still a very young sophomore, and he made such a big leap. Um, last year, he just looked like a broken prospect. I'm not gonna lie, like a, that, that's what he looked like to me, like a guy with this confident shot after getting uh, skipped on in the draft, right at number one, and. He recovers to this extent, and he's just such a reliable force for Houston to the point where, like, you told me last year Jabari was getting suspended a game. The Rockets might be better. I'm not going to lie. Like, <laughs> this year, the, Jabari's getting suspended a game, that's a big loss, especially with Shengu now. Right? Like, that, that's a big loss that the Rockets are going to have to deal with. Uh, and, you know, this is a team trying to make the play-in tournament. They're a game and a half behind the Warriors, right? So every game matters. Um, but the fact that I'm having that thought... Just leads me back to the, the, this dude's just so different. He's just so different, and and he's building out his body, and he's get he he looks so much more fluid. Like again, like the yoga thing. I'm I'm a believer. Like I like, <laughs> I, I I was never a vegan Chris Paul thing, right? Like I, I never bought that. Right? I was like I was like, Chris Paul had a year to recover from his hamstring, and that's what happened, right? Jabari's hips look so much more fluid. And mobile than than they did last year. He looks like a different mover, right? Like oh. that, he, I, that. I think this is something, right? Like the, I think the yoga yeah. was something. Well, I think the thing about Jabari is that the most notable thing about him is that he is smart and hardworking, and he 
puts those two together in very effective ways. Like, people talk about guys' effort and motor, like, this is a hardworking guy, he's always getting a gym or whatever. You can really tell with Jabari that he does take instruction well. He takes training well. He's obviously doing the right training. Like, if you look at his possibility delta now versus, like, when he was drafted, I think the main difference is that the bottom, his floor is raised so much. He keeps raising his floor. He keeps covering up weaknesses and becoming more consistent. And those are signs of, I think, of a really heady, really competent player. Like, this is the kind of guy who's going to be in the league for, like, 20 years, in my opinion. Because no, I'm, he's... I'm with you, yeah. Yeah, he, he knows how to make changes and how to keep himself relevant. Already, he's already doing this. You think he's not going to do this in, like, year 15, you know, when he's slowing down or whatever? He's not going to figure out how he can continue to be relevant and continue to get salaries? This is a... This is going to be a keeper, a player. He's... I understand why he was picked three behind Paolo Banquero and uh, Chet Holmgren, but he's, like, obviously <laughs> worth a, th a third pick. He's obviously an excellent player as a keeper for the Rockets or whoever else he ends up playing for in the rest of his career. So, yeah, he's great to watch play because you can tell that he is, he is a grown man out there. He's a professional, and he knows how to make himself effective. Yeah, and I say it on draft night, like, uh, and I say it again. This may have ended up being the best possible situation for him from a basketball fit perspective. I don't yeah. think him going to Orlando was going to do him any favors. Like, him having to be that guy in Orlando, like, no. Like, that's not his skill set, right? Like, not yet. Maybe he, eventually he gets there. But that's not where he should start his NBA journey, right? Like, and in Oklahoma City, I think perhaps there was a pathway for him being a nice complementary talent. But Chet's being asked to do a lot offensively. Right, like he's kind of like one of their three most important offensive players. Whereas in Houston, like he, Jabari's like fourth or fifth yeah. in the totem pole, right? And like I kind of think he deserves more attempts, but at the same time, it's kind of perfect for him in that he kind of gets to develop very organically, right? In that from a yeah. ball handling perspective, he kind of is like fourth or fifth on the totem pole. From a creation perspective, he is kind of there. But can I see him climbing the ladder? Yeah. I, I very much can't because I'm seeing legitimate growth, like ball handling so much better year over year. Um, he, he's taking the ball. Like how many times this this year for us have we seen him get the ball off the rim and go four court with it and finish? Right? And We've finish. Yeah, yeah, like a lot. And, and he's confident about it too. He like he does it steadfast. He does it st steadily. He's steady when he does that. He isn't. Because so, I mean, some guys will do that even though they're not suited to doing it, right? He doesn't have unfounded confidence. He has founded confidence. He has, ex he knows exactly how good he is, and that's an exceptional skill. Because you're right, yeah, he has gotten better at this, but he's not pushing it. He's not forcing the issue. He just, every now and again, the situation calls for a skill set that he doesn't need to use most of the game. And then he can do it. Which I think is, I really think that... When they and, and, get, and, and I will say this: when he does that, when he does do mm -hmm. that move, it's like I you you forget that he's like, oh they have him too, right? <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. It's it's very much that that thought that comes in your head. Yeah, this is the kind of guy that later, like a couple years down the road in his career, whenever they are in the playoffs, is a guy who will like randomly win you a game or two in a series because he's like, hey, guess what? You need this guy to do a thing he doesn't usually do. It's the playoffs, and now that's really helpful that he can, like, ball handle. Now it's really helpful that he can, like, create a little bit. This this guy who they thought was one thing is actually something else. I think that kind of, like, latent versatility that he has could be really good once his team actually is relevant. Yeah, that he can, like, guard Giannis, right? Like, yeah. Like, like, like that's, what, what a ridiculous thing. Like, like, like he, can, <laughs> he can do that and do the other things he does on a basketball court. Um and the mid-range jumper, like, it's still it's still patented for him, right? Like, it's still, like, his go-to mm -hmm. jumper, and he still goes to it a lot. Um, just the Rockets don't have to use it, right? And, and perhaps, you know, as he gets better, the Rockets will find themselves in a position where it's like, hey, why not we give this guy the ball, like, 12 or 13 times a game, have him score uh, as much as he can? Because, yeah. I mean... I mean, he from an efficiency perspective, there's reason. There's really no reason they're not. There's really no reason for them not to do that now, right? Like, cause he is yeah. kind of like that efficient at scoring the ball. Um, it's just, it's just. I want to keep an eye on. And, and and a big part of this run, like a big part of the reason I think, like he is allowing them to play this open brand of basketball. The like his ability to stretch the floor 
and play center is so key to what Houston's be, being able to do right now, right? Because people are saying amend the center. Amend's not the center. It's Jabari, right? Amend's yeah. just in the center. He's just always <laughs> in the center, right? But, yeah. Right? Jabari is playing center, and he's stretching the floor for these guys. He's so important. He doesn't get talked about enough, but that spacing he's creating for everybody is opening up everything for Houston. Hey, you need a stretch drive in today's NBA. He is an extremely valuable commodity. Mm-hmm. And I think um, actually like having Stephen Adams and Jeff Green there, kind of having him as like having those guys as mentors, is actually going to be a, a good help for those guys for him, particularly Jeff Green, because Jeff Green was a guy who came into the NBA didn't know what the hell he was good at. <laughs> right like yeah. that's that's why he bounced around you you always hear about you know people kind of like during games during broadcast you hear about uh these these color commentators kind of poking fun at jeff green how, how he how he has been a journey like a 20-year journeyman right which is you know by the way how often do you see that a 20 year old a 20-year career journeyman <laughs> but but that, that's what he's been right and you'll see these announcers do that but the reason that he did bounce around is because like for the longest time jeff green didn't know what the hell he was Right, as a basketball talent. And I'm not trying to make comparisons to Jabari, but I'm saying, like, last year it felt like Jabari didn't know who he was. Right? And this year it feels like he knows what he is. He's growing more confident in that role. And having those guys kind of have as a, a guiding path for him, I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, can we talk about, you mentioned it, can we talk about the playoff situation? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't really have much notes on this because I, I haven't done the math. I'm not good at schedule math. Yeah. But, like, it looks like there's a, there's an outsized chance. That, yeah. So, yeah. they're back at 500, 35 and 35, which, honestly, very remarkable given where they were a few weeks ago. Fantastic. you love to see it. Just, just being at 500 is an achievement for them right now. They're currently the 11th seed at 500. Right, I I was curious at this. I looked something up because I was like, they might they might win like 41, 42 games, and miss the play in entirely. That's like very much on the table that that could happen. In fact, like the only thing I think it's more likely that they miss than they make it in, and I think it's be tough. For the, but it's not. I don't think they're gonna miss it necessarily because they're not gonna win enough games. Right. I think they could very well. Make it to forty-one wins and miss the playoffs and miss the play entirely. And I was curious. I was like, how often do eleven seeds like have this level of win total? Like, how rare is it for an eleven seed to have beat five hundred or better? Do you want to know when the last time it happened? Shoot, it has not happened. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> eleven seeds don't have don't play at five hundred. This this is a really weird year in terms of like the middle of the pack. Every team is kind of decent in a way that we just like haven't really seen in a very very long time. I mean, it feels very twenty fourteen Western Conferences. Do you remember that that year where every first round series was a game seven? Yeah, that was yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, like like uh, the Rockets played like a game six again. That's where they lost the Dame shot, right? Like that was like, the Dame year, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like that year w- felt very similar to this year, except like I don't think there's there's a little bit more separation up top, right? The, the top yes. of the Western Conference is a little bit better than the top of the Western Conference that year, right? Yeah, it's but, the thing. Yeah, there's very few really really good teams this year. Like I think it's a fairly small like. In the East, you have the Celtics, and in the West, you have like the Nuggets and the and the Wolves and the Clippers and the Thunder yeah. and kind of the Clippers, right? Like, there's like five teams that actually feel like they're like serious contenders, and like kind of no one else is, but everyone else is like pretty good. So as I keep saying, this is a ter- this is a great year to be great, but it's a terrible year to be good. Like the Rockets in like any other year would be comfortably in the play-in situation. I think most years the Rockets would be like an eight or nine seed. Like, I think the, the vast majority of years of the NBA, like, playing at a 500-ish level is going to get you into the playoffs. But, but they expect- picked a bad year to do it. Well, I mean, here's the, is, that, is it bad? Because from an expectation standpoint, I think this is kind of good. Like, and I know this, this sounds kind of like... I, I really do think public perceptions play a role in, like, healthy front office decision, like, organizational decision-making. Yeah. Right? Like, I think if the Rockets make... 
let's say, let's say they made the playoffs this year, right? I think that would lead to lead to the wrong kind of expectations for them next year, right? Like, oh, they, if they're like an eight seed this year, that means next year they sh- they must be like a six seed at least, right? It's like, no, I think there's a possibility they take a step back the next year, right? If they were like an eight seed this year, right? Because that's they're still built, they're still growing, or they're still building. You might have injuries, you don't know, right? Yeah. And and this year, like them being kind of like. Like on the border of the plan, even if they make the plan, I don't think they're going to make the playoffs, right? Like I think that's kind of like I'm happy ten, with that. Ten, actually, ten seeds don't make it in; they just don't. Don't worry about it. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever it is. Right? Like, like I, I like that the, they're kind of there. I don't want them to be much better than that. As crazy as that sounds, like what you don't want the Rockets. To be, yeah, I, I kind of don't because I think that would lead to the wrong organizational expectation. And as I said, and I know we said we weren't going to talk much front office uh, talk. Uh, you know, at the start of the show, but I did say a few weeks ago that I think Rafael Stone deserves an extension. And if you're telling me that the expectation for them was to make like the playoffs, like I think that's wrong, right? And I think I think Stone deserves credit for what they've done this year, right? And so like I would like for him to get like a modest extension. So like that's kind of why I'm like, okay, this is fine, this is fine. Like I'm whatever happens for the rest of the year, if they finish around this 500-ish territory. I'm not. I'm not going to be upset yeah. with what they do, right? Like, I, no. really, if, yeah. At this point, they'd have to like lose out every game for it to be worrying, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's. I'm happy with the season. Like, I'm content with it. Like, they they set out and accomplished what I wanted them to set out. Right. Uh, now, Jalen still has to continue this. Right. Like, yes. I don't <laughs> think. Like again, I was not a, a leap guy, but like. His numbers have kind of normalized to where, like, they're on they're on par with the rest of his his career statistics, right? So I I at least like that to continue, right? And then next year you can go for the leap, but this year you kind of have to stay at this level, right? Because if you yeah. show, if, it gets worrying if if you if you if you dip below this. Well, I mean, it's it. You have growth within seasons as well, so it looks like. They've grown within the season. Honestly, the whole team looks like they've grown within the season. Like, I kind of think the formula for why they're doing so well right now is a combination of the team has actually improved over the season, first off. Like, the players have figured each other out. They they do work better together. They have just improved. Like, a number of players have just gotten better. Right? Like, I'm in. Yeah, offensively for sure. So, the team has gotten better. Uh, the schedule has gotten much lighter. It was really nasty for the patches they're losing, and now it's really light and they're winning, which is not surprising. That's what it's supposed to happen. But so a combination of schedule getting lighter and the team showing improvement has like passed up the continued injury problems, right? So final like this may, this isn't really that surprising. They've been in a situation where you would expect them to do well, and where it's a sign that they have showed continued growth over the year. Obviously, you'd like to have everybody healthy, but Sometimes it can be, like you said, like a blessing in disguise to have to run guys you wouldn't normally run because then you do get different looks at the team. You do get different opportunities for people to play different ways. So this is a development year, you know, like as much as as much as we want to see them succeed, want to see them make the play in, would love to even see them, you know, make squeak into the playoffs or whatever. But that stuff doesn't matter. It's a development year. The point of this year is seeing improvement and seeing growth from the players and from the team and from the front office and from the coaching staff. And on that front, it's been an unmitigated success, right? They they have obviously grown this year. The wins are not the important part. That's for later. That's for, like, two years from now, right? That two, And even then, it's very early. Even two years from now is early to be worried about wins. Like, and I think you're right. Like, next year can't be about wins either. Next year, again, has to be about are we continuing to grow? Are we continuing to see development in our players? Are we continuing to establish the base that we're going to need once it really does matter how well we do? So, yeah, I, it will be a lot. E- it will be a lot easier to not be worried about the owners breathing down your neck if you if you are the eleventh or tenth seed this year, and then next year you're like the eighth seed. Then everything's copacetic, like no problem. You know, everybody's happy in that situation. But yeah, if you're like the seventh seed one year and the eighth seed next year then suddenly everything is very different. So I think you're not wrong about that, that it is, like, having room to grow is going to be good, and I think there there is going to be continued growth. We'll get to the next season next season, but right now this is a good end of the season. Uh, their schedule is going to get tougher. They will have a harder time winning games, but being at 35-35 and 35 right now is 
a great place to be. They don't have to win that many more games to to uh, to honestly have a really a really strong season. If they can make it to forty wins, they need to break out the champagne. For the end of it. They are thir- like they are thirteen games better than they were last year already. Yeah, right. Like they're at, they're at the thirty five <laughs> game mark. I had them winning thirty five games this year. Right? Like, well. like that that was my prediction. I was wrong, right? Like like they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna shatter that. Whether that's thirty eight wins or forty wins or whatever it ends up being, they're gonna shatter that. So, like, I I can't be upset, right? Like I I just yeah. the, the, that's my that's my. That's where I ultimately end up. It's like I just I can't be mad at what happened for the rest of the year. Now, you're, if you tell me they, they like lose every single game from the year you're on out and they get blown out by twenty and Jalen's crap again, right? Yeah, that's not good, right? Obviously, like yeah. there's some, there's some there's some nuance of what I'm saying, right? Yeah. But like if re- if they reasonably close out the season how we kind of expect them to, I can't be mad at this. Right, I, I'm I'm very very happy at what they achieved this year. I think it surprised most people, and including me. Like I didn't see this. Um, I, I I did you see them being a, like this good this year? Um, I thought they would be like 35 to 37, like 35 to 38 wins. Is kind of where okay. I suspected, but they're they're better than that because yeah. they got hurt a bunch. And lost a bunch of games to that. Like, honestly, they are a forty to forty-two win team. Like, that's what they've looked like all year. Every every metric has them at like break even or better. Like within about like, yeah. yeah, they're a they're a they're a slight they're like a five hundred to like slightly better than five hundred team is how they measured out all season, which is better than I thought. I thought they'd be a little bit worse than five hundred, and they might end up the season with less than. 41 wins. They might end up with a losing record this year because basketball games. But their numbers are good. They've looked good all year. The, like in most seasons this would easily be a team with a winning with a winning record, right? They'd be looking at like ending the season with like 42 to 44 wins, I think in most seasons, which is really impressive. That's really good. They're slightly better than break even. Yeah. Excellent. That's better than any of us expected. I mean, I remember back when the season was starting and their win totals came out, and it was, what, like, 32? Right? It was, like, 31 and a half or something? Yeah, I thought and, it was too low, whatever it was. Yeah. Yes. Well, and, but lots of pundits were, like, 10 more wins is a lot year to year. That's a huge improvement. Like, we shouldn't... You shouldn't expect that much improvement from this team. And the fact that, you know, they did make a lot of changes. Like, from our perspective, paying attention to the team every day, we could see all the things of them and be like, yeah, that's probably a couple wins there, a couple wins there, a couple wins there, a couple wins there, right? Like, it didn't seem crazy if they'd win, like, 32 games to, to those of us who are watching the team all the time. But 10 wins is a big jump. Like, we shouldn't we shouldn't just discount what everyone, all the national media said, because that is a big jump. Like, they're like, that's unusual for teams to make a 10-win jump. And it is. And they should take pride in that. Like, they should take pride in the fact that they went from being an absolute doldrum team to being a pretty decent team within the span of a year. They made the right choices, they made good hires, and they made good signings. It's been a good year. 100%. Uh, so, I'm going to read something to you. Uh, this is a, I'm going to say Team X. Team X okay. won 24 games. The following year, they win 42 games. Who is Team X? That's Salco the City Thunder. Yeah. That's OKC from... <laughs> That's OKC two, a couple years ago. Yeah, a couple yep. years ago. They made a similar jump. Right now, I'm not, I'm not saying yeah. they're going to be what OKC is. What OKC is this year is ridiculous, right? Because Shea, Shea made an MVP leap, right? Which no one saw coming. But he became that guy. I'm not sure if... You know, we'll see if someone on this roster makes that kind of a jump. I think there, It's pretty rare... <laughs> We'll say right. that. Well, there's one guy that I think has that upside, right? Like, and it's the guy that's yeah. not playing right now, right? Like, if if he makes that kind of a jump, I mean, then the sky's the limit, right? But right. assuming normal growth, I think we can probably see this team 45-ish wins next year. I think that's a reasonable goal for them. Or maybe yeah, depending on depending on yeah. the climate of the, so the season. I mean, I feel like it's oftentimes better to contextualize it in terms of, like, net rating or like you know like 
like adjusted that rating or something, right? Like if they're at like around a one right now, you want to see them at like like a two, right? If they can have a plus a net rating of like in the two range next season, that's really good. It's only one point, but one points a lot in the NBA, and so if they if they can get like a point two positive rating next year, then yeah, they're gonna be in that like mid forties range. Yeah, uh, for what it's worth. Uh dunksin3s.com uh, does these uh, projection models for you know every team. Right now they have yeah. they have Houston at the 11th seed uh, with 41.3 wins. Um, yeah, that's, that sounds kind of right. Yeah, I mean that that that's it feels kind of right. I'm not like and they have uh, Golden State at 43, uh, the Lakers at 44. I mean that's enough margin to where you have a chance, man. Like you have a chance, like. I don't want to get Rockets fans like hopes up, but like, I, I think you have something to watch for to close this to close the year out. Look, is what I say. End it, ending this year at five hundred is a prize in and of itself, regardless of where they end up in the standings. Like, not being a losing team is a big deal. That's great. Like, every Rockets fan should bust open a bottle of champagne if they hit that forty-first win, in my opinion, because that is celebratory. Whether they make the plane or not, who cares? The that problem will will deal with itself farther on down the line. I mean, I'll be doing that at like thirty eight wins, right? Like, I'll, or, or like even if they get to forty, like, like that's way Great. past yeah. what I thought them what <laughs> yeah. they were going to be this year. Um, yeah, the high end has them being forty three and a half. I mean, that, that, that's what they have on the high end of the wins projection. Which, I mean, if they hit their high end, they have a chance. I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, like a lot of things are up. Uh, like we're gonna have to see how they do in this next game with without Jabari. We're gonna have to see what they're gonna do when the, when their schedule gets tougher. But it's just fun to watch them be good. It's fun to yeah. watch Jalen be good. Like it's fun to watch Ime be. Like it's fun. It's fun for the Rockets to have competent coaching, right? Like like this is just <laughs> it's just it's just good vibes. Like I, I like this. Whatever this is, I like this. Yeah. Well, it's the next game is against what the Blazers. Yeah, they're playing the Blazers. Um, yeah, on on Mon- yeah tomorrow, yeah. and like, if you're gonna have Jabari missing a game, you probably want it to be against a team who has pretty good incentives to tank out right now, right? Like they, if I'm the Blazers, I'm trying to lose every game possible for the last few weeks because they can move their pickups like meaningfully, right? They're like one loss behind uh, the Hornets. So, that's no guarantee. Now, I want to make that clear that teams lose to tanking teams all the time because the NBA is a difficult place and losing another player is another difficulty for the Rockets. So, we can't, there's there's absolutely no guarantee. But, if you were going to lose Jabari to a suspension and get for one game, I'd probably pick this game. Yeah, yeah. And on the other, on the other side of the bracket, you got the Brooklyn Nets expected to finish at 31 wins. I mean that that draft pick's gonna be. I mean it's not a great draft, but I mean it's just nice that. Houston hey, picks has, a pick. Yeah, it's nice that Houston has another lottery pick in their back pocket, uh, and we're gonna be doing this this draft analysis thing again in like a month, uh, which should be fun. Again, I I, I'm actually excited yeah. for the draft. I, I haven't done much research. The, le- the least amount of research I've done for a draft uh, in the Rockets <laughs> rebuild, but I'm excited. I'm excited again. Well. Into it. Hey, I think that pick is going to get conveyed to Oklahoma City Thunder. I think the ship has sailed on potentially getting a top four pick for the Rockets this year, and that is very good. <laughs> I'm okay with it. I'll take it. Mm-hmm. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher. Forrest, where can, the, where can the people follow you on Twitter? At Do Nots, D-U-N-O-T-S. Yeah, guys. We'll talk to you guys next week.